the whole dopamine system starts to reboot. And you mentioned earlier on, and I've spoken about this on the podcast before, that we don't just eat when we're hungry, right? We eat our emotions. We eat often to fill a hole in our hearts, not a hole in our stomach. Mm. And you, you beautifully write in the book how when we're eating, a lot of the time we're choosing foods that give us a dopamine rush, right? You also mentioned eating disorders. Yes, we need to exercise caution. But I wonder if one of the reasons that people who have had a troubled relationship with food, why fasting, if done responsibly in the right way with support, I wonder if one of the reasons it works so well is because it does reset dopamine and reset someone's entire relationship with food in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So it, think of dopamine resistance a little bit like insulin yeah. resistance. The mechanisms are not completely similar, but the concept is, is analogous. So what we know about uh, people who are obese, people who um, have food addiction issues, is that when they're eating, they are not getting the same dopamine response as they used to, and they're not getting the same dopamine response as, per, let's say, somebody who doesn't have a food addiction. So I quote a study in the book was done on obese individuals, and they found that it took more food in order for that person who was o obese to be able to have pleasure from that food. So when we talk about food addiction, a lot of it is we got to keep eating because we're not getting that same dopamine high. Now you throw in a 48 hour fast and all of a sudden we've got a situation where we've reset that system and you take somebody who's struggled with food addiction, somebody who's trying to reverse obesity, you give them a meal and now they're getting enjoyment out of it. Now they're like, whoa, this, I actually love this. And they're not needing, they're not mm. craving more and more and more. Yeah. So, so, so powerful. Now let's go back to the cycle. Right. We've got the phases which you've, you know, beautifully explained for people. Now, now that we understand that there are different lengths of fasts, how do we superimpose those fasting lengths on the different phases of the menstrual cycle? Yeah. So this this is pretty straightforward. And you know, if if people listening, if you're this is brand new hormonal language, I'm a visual learner. So I put a lot of graphs in in the in the book. But you also can just Google a woman's menstrual cycle. And when you see it over a 30 day period, what I the, the general principle is when hormones are high. So manifestation phase, nurture phase, we need to change our fasting behavior. When hormones are low, we can really fast as long as we want. You can do all six of those fasts. So with that in mind, let's go through what I call the fasting cycle. The first power phase you can throw a three-day water fast in. In fact, if you have PCOS, I encourage you to th put a, try a three-day water fast and watch your body start to become insulin sensitive again and watch the symptoms of PCOS go away. If you are struggling to get pregnant, we've seen this so many times in our community and in my clinic where all of a sudden, if your issue is insulin uh, resistance and estrogen imbalances, throw in some of those longer fasts in that first power phase and in the, the power phase that happens after you ovulate. So those are that those six fasts all fit in there. And I really want to encourage people to try to up your fasting game as you start to learn this tool and go into the longer fast for healing during that time. So during the manifestation phase, now this one's really interesting because we have all these hormones at their peak. And one of the things we know about hormonal um it rises and decline. We see this a lot in menopause is when hormones come up and then they, they decline very quickly. Like what happens around that ovulation period is oftentimes toxins are released from our stored tissue. So heavy metals, plastics, glyphosate, phthalates, all the toxins that are in our world. So because we know when hormones are up, we're going to get a little bit of a detox effect I strongly recommend if your toxic load is high, you're not going to want to do more than like a 15, 16 hour fast during manifestation phase, or you're going to see some detox reactions. This is where women start saying, oh, I'm gaining weight fasting. I've got brain fog when I'm fasting. 
I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to get into ketosis when I'm fasting. A lot of that could be a toxic dump. So I really encourage women to keep those fasts under, under 16 hours, stay with an intermittent fast during that time. Yeah. So let's just recap a little bit. Um, first phase, power phase, day zero, well, day one to day 10, we've already said that's a, that's a phase where women can tolerate a degree of stress. You're saying in that phase, fast as long as you want, like within reason, right? You can do any length of those fast because you can manage it then. Okay. But then when you go to sort of day 10 to 15, the manifestation phase, the ovulation phase, when testosterone is rising, you're saying, just be cautious then, don't go above 15 or 16 hours, and maybe even a little bit less potentially at that time. Now, you also mentioned, Mindy, detoxification. If you're detox, if you're If your toxin load is high, now I think there's going to be some people listening who have no idea what that means. And I want to bring in there something you also said. I think it was in your book. Your favorite phase is the manifestation phase. And you say the focus then switches from producing hormones to metabolizing hormones. And I think just explaining that around detoxification, I think those two things might fit quite nicely for people there. Yes. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up because this is another part of the hormone conversation that we're not culturally having, which is taking a hormone doesn't mean your body knows how to use those cells are not always using that hormone. And we see this a lot with thyroid medication where a woman will go on a thyroid uh, medication, but she still doesn't feel different. And that's because all hormones have to be metabolized a better way to look at metabolize is that all hormones have to be broken down into a usable um, uh, formula that the cells can actually put into action. So where does that breakdown happen? It happens in the liver and it happens in the gut. So when we look at the manifestation phase during this ovulation period, We've got all these hormones really, really high. We've got estrogen and testosterone at their peak. The focus needs to now switch from producing hormones to breaking those hormones down. So liver, there's a lot of foods that will support the liver. I think this is a great time to lean into the bitter foods, the radicchios, the lemons, the ginger, the arugula. I think this is a great time to avoid alcohol or anything that would put a stress on the liver because you need your liver to break down all of these hormones. We also have to look at gut health. So I talk in the book about the three P's, which is polyphenol, probiotic, and prebiotic foods. Can we bring more of those fermented foods in? Can we bring more nuts and seeds in? Can we bring more of the green leafy vegetables in? If we support the liver and the gut during that time and use food as our hormonal tool to be able to break these hormones down, now we're going to really take our hormonal balance to the next level. Yeah, it's brilliant. And in the book, you do talk about alongside fasting, the foods that will support whatever you're doing with the fasting, or even if you're not fasting, the foods that will support various phases of the cycle, which again is why I think this book is going to be useful for any woman, because just what you said there, right? Days 10 to 15, you need your liver working for you, right? So yeah. you don't want to be putting in alcohol then, because you're yeah. just going to make it harder to detoxify the hormones, you know, clear those hormones out of your body. I do think that's something that a lot of people even within mainstream medicine, don't quite understand that there's hormones and then the hormones need to be processed and removed out of the body. And that gets done through the liver, through the guts and, you know, the regularity of your uh, bowel movements, you know, what you're putting in. You talk about cruciferous vegetables and all these other types of foods that you mentioned can really support detoxifying those hormones. You also write about how if we don't detoxify those hormones well and they stick around, there's an impact, isn't there? That, yes, and, and such a great piece of the conversation that needs to be highlighted, which is you have all these hormones come in and if you are not supporting the liver, if you are not getting enough vegetables, vegetables are key for that. There's a whole set of bacteria in your gut called the estrobilome 
and it breaks down estrogen. These microbes break down estrogen. So how do we feed them? How do we support them so they can break estrogen down? And that's through a lot of green leafy vegetables. It's through those three P's categories that I talked about. If you are not supporting them during this key time, then that estrogen is going to be stored. And where it gets stored is in anywhere that there is fat. So it's going to go into the breast tissue um, and, and it can start to throw uh, the big place it goes is the breast tissue. It can start to make you accumulate more fat. Your body will put it on belly fat. It'll put it around fat around your hips and your, your glutes that you're trying to so actively perhaps get rid of. So it's, that is why it's like in that phase, we have to switch our focus to, okay, I made them now. I spent the first 10 days trying to support an environment that allowed these hormones to do what they need to do. But now I'm in this phase of my cycle where I need to support how to break them down. This is not just so you feel good in the moment. It has That's right. other implications as well. Okay. So we're the woman's ovulated, right? We're at day 15, uh, assuming there's a regular cycle. Then we move into the second power phase. What should we be thinking of then when we're thinking about fasting and also our diet, I guess, the, the two things fit alongside each other, don't they? Yeah. So when you come out of that phase around day 15, 16, you can go back into some of the longer fasts. So you're going to have a four day window where if you want to throw in a 24 hour fast, you want to do the 48 hour dopamine fast, you can throw it in there. And because hormones are low, you can go back to a more low carb style of eating if that's what the way that you eat. So it's it's another dip and moment in the cycle where we can power up on these tools. We can also, you could push your workouts. You can go ramp up your social calendar. You can, you know, do a higher workload during that time because the hormones are, are low. So you can go back into any of these, these longer fasts to use them for their healing uh, effect. Okay, I got to interrupt this video because I have a free guide for you so you can master fasting. It's called a beginner's guide to a fasting lifestyle. And all you've got to do is click here and you can jump right in. Yeah, there are these three phases of the cycle, one, two, and three, and it goes one, two, back to one again. That's right. And then you hit three. And this again, I think it's a of course, it's a very important phase. It's that one week or so, or maybe 10 days at the end of the cycle. It's that period of time before the periods where we've already said the body wants carbs. You're trying to support progesterone, I think you've already said at that time. That's right. You want to nourish yourself. We were talking about maybe doing more yoga and relaxation type activities at that period of time. What should we be doing then regarding fasting then? And uh, I guess food intake, we've already touched on a little bit, but maybe just talk about that particular part of the cycle. Yeah. So there, there's a lot to discuss on this part of the cycle when it comes to our lifestyle. Um, when, when it comes to fasting, if you're new to fasting, I strongly encourage you to not fast that week because what you don't want to do is raise cortisol. Once cortisol goes high, progesterone becomes shy. She, she is not going to make her debut. And you need progesterone to peak in order for the uterine lining to shed. So women who have a spot before their period, women that have heavy periods, a lot of times that's because we're not minding progesterone. She is not in her, you know, able to be produced. So if you're not, if you haven't fasted, then really be careful and, and, and don't fast during that time. Now, the second part of that question that I get asked a lot is with women who um, are like, but I, I rock fasting. I, I can do three day water fast. No problem. I'm metabolically flexible. Um, I would say still keep it under 13 hours. It's this is not, you know, if you're concerned about like a lot of women say, oh, I'm going to gain weight during that that time. I promise you, you won't if you follow the pattern that we've just walked you through. So we want to look at minimal fasting to no fasting. And then on the food front, we I talk in the book of something called hormone feasting foods. Yeah. And when it comes to progesterone, she wants you to eat certain foods. So we already talked about chocolate. I'm not saying don't eat chocolate, just eat good chocolate. Make sure it's clean, make sure it's not packed with sugar. Um, use that magnesium, use your sweet tooth during that time to your advantage. 
When you're craving carbs, go to the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, go to the squashes, go to things like quinoa, the citrus fruits, tropical fruits. I map them all out in the book. This is what uh, progesterone wants you to feed her. So we've got to change the diet. We've got to cut the fasting out and you will see like, it's crazy. I don't know if you saw this on my YouTube channel, but the number of women that are like, I followed this protocol and especially did what she said before the week before my period and my cycle was totally became got back in sync. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've seen those comments and I want to get to that because there's, there's so many different scenarios for women. I want to talk about ages under 35. I want to talk about 35 to 50, above 50, postmenopausal, if we have time. I mean, you are such right. a fountain of knowledge and the Thank book you. has got it all in anyway. Um, but I think even just that simplistic take home that at the start of your cycle, you can tolerate high stress, long fasts. The end of your cycle, you need low stress no fasting yeah. potentially, nourishing yourself, even that, right? If if that's all anyone takes away from this conversation, I think that can have profound implications for women and their partners and the men in their life, just that's to right. even know that simple fact. Yes, yes. And, and the, you know, if you're listening, you're like, wait, this is really confusing. Actually, when you break it down even more, it can be as simple yeah. as you just said. Um, some people, Mindy... I think we'll have heard those lengths of fasts and gone, wait a minute, the basic one is 12 to 16 hours. I need to eat every few hours. I can barely fast for 12 hours, let alone the 17 plus one, the 24, 36, right? So for that woman who's listening now who goes, I can't do any of this. What are you talking about? What would you say to them? Yeah, it's, I'm so happy you asked me this question because one of the concepts around metabolic health that we are not discussing enough is that if you struggle to go without food, you are in the beginning stages of mitochondrial dysfunction. You are in the beginning stages of diabetes if that's in your genetic profile. So we have to look at our hangry person, the hypoglycemic person, the person that can't go without food, that that is a warning sign. Yeah. I so what we have done is we tend to say, oh, it's just me. I can't do that. Like I, I can't tell you how many friends, personal friends yeah. of mine, are like, I love what you're doing, Mindy. I I just can't fast. And I come back to if you have to eat all day and you don't and you struggle to go eight hours without food, that is your body saying, warning, warning, we are in a mitochondrial mess and we need to clean things up. So in the book, I talk about something called a pre-reset, where I show how you can take a two-week period, yeah. and you can clean up your food, and you can slowly like back your way in to this fasting lifestyle. It doesn't have to be where you're going to suffer your way in. Your body wants to fast, so the more you train it to do it, it gets easier and easier and easier. So please stay open as we're having this conversation because the fact that you've got to eat all day is onto itself a warning sign that fasting can really help you clean up. Yeah, completely agree. Very, very important to pay attention and not just medicate that with more foods because right. you're just kicking the problem down the road. It's better to address it and go, let me see what I can do now to make sure I can go 8, 10, 12 hours because on an evolutionary um through an evolutionary lens, if we couldn't go more than eight hours without food, we wouldn't be here, right? That's man, right. man or woman. So there is something not quite working with your metabolic system that potentially can be repaired. Certainly in my experience, in most cases, it can be repaired if we start small and build up slowly. Okay, where are my gals that are struggling with hormonal imbalance? Bloated, feeling like you're not making progress with weight loss? you need to add these foods in so that you can support better hormonal health. There is a lifestyle that estrogen wants you to live, and there is a lifestyle that progesterone wants you to live.